Good morning. Um, my name is Hannah Dillard, and yeah, good morning. My dad does that. She makes fun of my dad for doing that. Um, but my name is Hannah Dillard, and I'm typically here on Wednesday mornings with South Lake doing their chapel. So it's good to be here this morning and this Sunday morning with y'all. But something that we talk about a lot in chapel is what is worship. And I always say that worship is responding to the greatness and the glory of God. That's something we're teaching the students. So I think that's a good reminder this morning that that's what we're here to do. Um, is just to be with each other and to be in communion and to respond to the greatness and the glory of God. So good morning. We do welcome Hannah. Uh, she is the teacher for music, but also for worship leadership at South Lake Christian Academy. And uh, Mike Wallace is away on another jaunt, international jaunt this weekend. But we were delighted that Hannah was available and willing to come and minister to us in music today. So grace and peace to you all from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome. Some of you are guests here today. We welcome you especially. So delighted to have each of you uh, here for various purposes. You probably came mainly for the hamburgers, but that's okay. That's okay, too. The glory of God is up there somewhere, I'm sure. And uh, we, will, we will worship together, and then we'll feast together in our cookout, to which all are invited. You may not even have known it was going on today, but you are most welcome. We'll adjourn from here, go out to the pavilion in the rear, beautiful fall day, and we'll have hamburgers and hot dogs and drinks and all the fixings and just enjoy time uh, together. This is our Missions Emphasis Month. Uh, all the five Sundays of October are being devoted to the Great Commission, to world evangelization, and you'll see some effects of that, some implications of that as we go through the service uh, today. We have goals for our month. This is the time to point us toward uh, striding ahead, achieving greater things for the Lord in giving and in praying, and our goal today for praying is that we'd have a hundred people committed to pray regularly for a missionary. That's about the number that we have here in the room today. So if each one of you wanted to sign up to pray regularly, we'd knock that goal out right off the bat. Regularly means you define regularly. It may mean every day. That's the way I do it. But I'm a preacher. Come on. You may want to do it once a week. Uh, you can do it whatever a regular uh, a program that you, you decide on will suit your needs or your fa families. We also want to encourage you as little children to get your children in on the, uh, on the fun and to begin to train them to have a heart for the, the people in the world, a heart for missionaries who go to serve them. And then for Faith Promise, which is the means by which we support our missionaries financially, we have three goals, adventurous goals this year, given the place where we are right now, uh, $60,000, $65,000, and $70,000. Contrary to what you may have read in the prayer notes in the weekly newsletter, I got a little carried away and put a hundred in front of that. Just disregard the, the third digit there. But it'll be sixty, sixty-five, dollars and $70,000 that we're looking for the Lord to raise up through our congregation, providing providing beyond what we think we can do on ourselves, what we know we can do on ourselves, by ourselves. And so uh, you be praying. We'll have more to say about that uh, later on as time goes by. All right. Those are our announcements. If you're viewing with us online today, we also welcome you through our live stream and would encourage you also to go to our website, slchurch.net, for general information. But also on the website, you can sign up to become one of our prayer participants. There's a form there right off the top of the uh, homepage. You can click on there and sign up and join us wherever you are, anywhere in the world. We would welcome uh, your participation. Now, hear God's word as he calls us to worship. May the peoples praise you, O Lord. May all the peoples praise you. Let us pray. Great are you, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. We acknowledge that from the beginning because we have experienced it. Your steadfast love is better than life. And so we come before you today in the name of Jesus, our Savior, to offer up a sacrifice of praise. And we ask your help now, humbly asking your help to help us do that very thing. And so grant us a full measure of your spirit. Inspire us, direct us, put love for you in our hearts, put a song to you on our lips. And may we be found among those peoples who truly praise you. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Please stand.
We are delighted to have Reverend Steve Jessup with us today. Steve and I are old buddies. Uh, you know, I still served at First Presbyterian Church Stanley for 26 and a half years, left there in 2015. In 2017, he was hired. I can't take any credit for it. I wish I had been able to take credit. <laughs> he was hired as the assistant pastor, and then in 2019, he became the pastor of First Presbyterian Church Stanley. Four years doing that, and then the Lord called him to go to work with Mission to North America, our denomination's home missions agency, in the area of disaster relief. And uh, some of you have met him already. I hope all of you will before it's done. But he's going to tell us what that's all about. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, Dan and Carol have been good friends of ours for a long time now, a mentor. And I can blame you some for getting me into uh, <laughs> back into the ministry. I was in construction world and uh, started meeting with Dan in his office. And little by little, next thing I knew, he had me preaching. And, uh, and then I was a assistant pastor. So... Dan, I credit you for uh, God using you to help guide and lead me through some times of transition and change. And so here I am. Uh, I've been with M&A Disaster Response for a year now, and uh, I've really enjoyed going around. I am the representative for North and South Carolina, and I've been to many different churches, and it's good to be here at South Lake, uh, kind of a sister church here with First Pres and so we're just so thrilled to be here. Uh, my wife, Julie, was not able to be here this morning, but Julie and I have been married for 32 years now. We have two girls uh, and one grandson. And so uh, I had the joy of being Papa <laughs> and uh, have enjoyed that. So we have moved to the Raleigh area to be close to our girls there. And uh, that's where we reside. But we're all over the place. Uh, this is my uh, third week back in the Charlotte area, and I got next week I'll be back once more. So uh, this is kind of our home turf. Uh, so let me talk just a minute about our ministry. Um, we have uh, d many different aspects to what we do. Uh, one of the things that I'm responsible for is training and disaster preparedness. So. One of the things that's important, and you know this from personal experience, it's always better uh, to be proactive than reactive, especially when it comes to disasters. It's important that you have systems in place to go and help people uh, when the need arises, and so you're not scrambling at the last second. So part of my role is to do training and equipping and building teams and having folks ready to go uh, when a disaster occurs uh, in our region. Uh, so that's part of it. If a disaster would take place, say uh, like a hurricane would hit Myrtle Beach or Charleston, uh, then I would be down there on the front lines and then I would be calling up Dan and saying, hey, Dan, uh, we need some folks to come down, men, women, youth to come and help us. And so we'll, we would set up uh, a, a work camp there for people to come and to serve and help folks uh, in need. So that's part of uh what I do, uh, but one of the things that is important to me, I want to share just two things that are really important to me, and that is the connection with the local church. So when we go to a disaster site, uh, we almost always partner with a local church, a PCA church or another Reformed uh, church body, and that church becomes our home base, and we go out in the name of Jesus, but also in the name of the church. So if we were in Myrtle Beach, for example, and working down there with Surfside PCA Church, we would go out into the community and help folks recover from a disaster and say, we're here, uh, but we also represent Surfside Church if you need a church home. So we always like to have that local church connection. The other side of it is the local church here then can help other local churches other places. So it's the connection between uh, one church with another church. So South Lake Church helping to uh, support a church that has been affected by a disaster. And so this is really the nature of the body of Christ, that we help each other, and especially in Presbyterian circles. We are connectional churches, and so we believe in the local church. One of the things I have a, really have a heart for, too, is encouraging local churches to get involved in disaster relief ministry right here in your community. Uh, whether or not you realize that there are a lot of mini disasters all around this area, folks who need help, uh, folks who are in a difficult place in their lives and need uh, some hope. And so if you enjoy 
serving and working, uh, even if it's cleaning up a yard or uh, helping someone uh, with a house project, uh, or even just stopping by to bring a meal and encourage someone and have a prayer. These are all ways that we can help folks who are in times of need. And so I like to encourage every church that I talk to to think about how you can apply the principles that we use in disaster response uh, right here in your local community. And so uh, one of the things we'll be talking about with South Lake in the coming uh, months and years is, you know, how you all can do that. Uh, help us when we need help, but also serve in your community uh, in very tangible, hands-on ways. So we call this a word and deed ministry. So we go out and we serve, and the good deeds that we do, we know in Reformed theology that it's not to, for our salvation, but it's to bring glory to God. It's to advance his kingdom. So as we go out and we help people, we are opening doors for sharing the gospel. And that's what our ministry is all about, uh, having opportunities to share with people that we otherwise would not be able to uh, have an open door with. And so this is a, first and foremost a gospel ministry. We are sharing the hope of Christ uh, with those who have suffered some type of uh, trauma, whether it be to their house uh, or losing a loved one or uh, just uh, being affected by a disaster in some way. I'd encourage you afterwards, uh, I have a table on the back. We have a newsletter. If you would sign up for our newsletter, that way you can pray for us and, and keep track. And I will also send out, if there's a need, I'll send out an email uh, for folks to respond to that as well. Uh, so you can pray for us as we need wisdom. Uh, we have uh, 220 six churches in my region uh, under 11 presbyteries. So there's a lot of folks to talk to. And so I need wisdom as to uh, where to go and, and who to talk to and how to reach that many churches uh, with this message. So if you could pray for our wisdom uh, as we raise our support. Uh, I noticed that you have your uh, prayer challenge here. And I don't want to take away from any of the other folks, but you could add our name on here. I don't think uh, anyone would be opposed to that. So you can certainly pray for us. That would be first and foremost what we would uh, appreciate from you. I'll just close with a quick story. We were in Neon, Kentucky last year. There was a tremendous flooding in that area. And it flooded out this downtown area of Neon. And there's an Orthodox Presbyterian church that we were helping there. And the church is on the bottom floor of this old, it's an old uh, downtown area. And on the top floor was the, pa is the pastor's apartment. The bottom floor was filled with eight feet of water and mud. And so uh, our denomination partnered with the OPC, and we helped send equipment and teams to go and help clean up. Uh, but Julie and I were up there after the disaster, and about a month after, and we were walking around, and there was a guy uh, sitting up on his balcony uh, with his wife. And uh, we started talking to them, and he was sharing with us how they sat on that very balcony during the flood, had nowhere to go, and things were just houses and cars and uh, all kinds of debris was just flowing past them as they watched helpless to do anything. And they had a florist shop below that was completely destroyed. And so he came down from the balcony to talk with us, and he wanted to show us the cleanup process in their florist shop. And they had... Uh, made some progress. And so we talked to him and uh, we said, what's your name? He said, my name is Fudge. So Fudge is uh, the owner of the florist shop. If you're ever in Neon, Kentucky, go in and give him some business. Uh, but we had the opportunity to pray with him and to just ask God to encourage him in this difficult time. And uh, as we put our arms around him and prayed with him, he began to cry and said, I just, we just really needed this encouragement. It's been really hard for us. And so it's just little touches like that in people's lives uh, that share the hope of Jesus to those uh, who are in need. So thank you for your time and uh, just glad to be here at South Lake. Look forward to, I'll be here for lunch, of course, and uh, be happy to talk to you more about it. So if you're kind of like me, a hands-on kind of guy or gal uh, or youth, then uh, come talk. We find a place for you.
This is a good guy to work for. He's a general contractor. He knows the scriptures, but he also knows the nuts and bolts and screws of how things, uh, how things are supposed to go together. I want to pray for you now, Steve, with one, one requirement. You said we could pray for you by putting your name in on the yellow sheet there, yes. which is true. But would you join us in our efforts to have 100 people praying regularly? Would you be one of our praying partners? I would. To pray for a missionary? Absolutely. Right. I just got to pick who I'm, I'm going to. I got to look here. We got our first, uh, first uh, sign up here. Oh, admittedly, with a little pressure. <laughs> but he would have done it anyway. I know him well enough to know. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for my friend Steve. I thank you that he's a friend of uh, sinners, just like Jesus was. I thank you that he's a friend of the church, just like Jesus is. And I thank you that he's a friend of the, of the downcast and the, the helpless. And he is applying his theology as well as his technical skills to relieving suffering and motivating the church to join in. And so I pray you'd bless him and enable his ministry, but you'd also give us vision, give us uh, an eye toward how we can come alongside and step out beyond our comfort zone and our self, uh, self-sufficiency to, to live, to pour out into the lives of those around us who are in, in need. So uh, guide in this matter, help us to partner well and wisely. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank Lord you, bless Dave. you, my friend. Appreciate it. Our first scripture reading for the morning comes from Psalm 67. I'll be reading it in its entirety. It's only seven verses, the 67th Psalm. This is the word of God. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. Then the land will yield its harvest, and God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but this, the word of our God, stands forever. Please join me in a time of prayer as we confess our sins to God and seek his pardon. Please pray pray silently, and I'll follow with a corporate prayer immediately after. Let us pray. Lord, it's easy for us to pray with the psalmist that you would be gracious to us and bless us, that you'd make your face shine upon us. Who wouldn't want that? It's the next part that's hard, that we would seek such blessing for the benefit of others, that we'd seek such blessing so that salvation would come to the nations. You have a purpose in all this. There's a goal in our blessing And most of the time, that's lost on us, we must confess. You bless us in order that the nations might know your name and be saved. So often, we think it's all about us. We ask your favor, we receive it, but for our sake. We enjoy your grace, but we assume it stops with us. We can't get past ourselves. We can't conceive of ourselves merely as conduits. For the grace and favor that you would pass through us to the nations of the earth. Forgive us. Forgive us our self-centeredness and pride. Forgive us our greedy pursuit of blessing just so we can enjoy being blessed. Forgive us our forgetfulness that as your word instructs us to whom much is given, of him much will be required. Forgive us when we've consumed your lavish blessings on ourselves without considering for a moment that it might not really be meant for our consumption at all, but rather that it might be the means by which you intend your ways to become known on earth and your salvation come to all nations. Forgive us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's God's own word offering a quick word of assurance But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed 
for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Believing, repentant sinner, know, believe that in Christ you are forgiven. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand and continue to worship? Suffering the 
receive our morning tithes and offerings. Thank you. If you would join with me in prayer, please. Father, we recognize your holiness. We have no standing before you except through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our righteousness comes through your grace and mercy alone. Without your mercy, all of us would be destitute with no hope and eternally bound for hell. Father, we thank you that you've provided a way of escape from every temptation we encounter. We thank you for the convicting work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, leading us into righteousness and away from sin. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you. We thank you that you have brought each of us here to worship you. We ask you to help us demonstrate your love through our service to each other. Help us glorify your name through our worship today. Father, help us not to think too much of ourselves. Help us not only to pray for each of the requests we see, but help us to become the servant to all that we encounter. Help our fellowship to strive to surrender our pride and self-reliance for your service to every person you bring our way. Father, I pray for our families. I thank you for your mercy to each of us. Help us live our lives within our families so that our testimony illustrates our commitment to you. Father, we pray for our church. Please help us serve you in every aspect of our lives. Please help us have your perspective on our ministry. Father, finally, we pray for peace in Jerusalem. During this time of uncertainty, we pray for your guidance and the protection of your people. 
please help us to stand on your word, your promises, and in our relationship with Israel. Please help us to have the courage to act in faith in these times of concern. If you would join with me as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks very much, Sam, boys and girls, because we love you so much. We have a special place in the service every week just for you. It's the children's message. Come and meet me up front. We're going to do it right now. Abby is always the first one up. I just want to give her a gold star. Good job, Abby. Where do you get that energy? I'd like to buy about a bushel. Because you've, you've been working? Yeah, well, that's a wonderful thing to hear. Well, good morning. I'm glad to see you. Where do we begin? With the Bible. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, here's what we read. Listen, brothers, pray for me. Brothers, pray for me. That was the Apostle Paul writing, asking people to pray for him. Can I tell you a story? Would you listen and, and pay attention if I told you a story this morning? This is a true story. There was a missionary who was very, very sad. He had been working way up north, high above where we live, in northwestern territories of Canada. That's way up, way up here. And he had been working for years trying to tell people about Jesus. But nobody seemed to want to hear. They didn't pay any attention. They didn't care about Jesus. And he tried to tell them and tried to teach them. He tried to love them. He tried to be a friend to them so they would listen and know about Jesus. But nobody seemed to care. And he was very, very sad. And after years of this, he got very, very tired. And he just said, I think I'll just quit. He said, I'm so tired and I'm so sad. I'm going to go to bed tonight, but I think when I get up in the morning, I'm just going to quit being a missionary because nobody wants to hear. And he went to bed. The next morning he woke up, but he felt better. And he had a little, little energy, had a little, a little hope. And he decided, I'll not quit. I'll keep on trying to tell people about Jesus. Well, there was another missionary now, that man was way up here in Canada. There was another missionary down here in South America, the country of Colombia in South America, seven, more than 7,000 miles away. He was this first missionary, this sad missionary's brother, and he was worried about his brother because he was so sad. He asked some friends of his to pray with him for his sad brother, and his friends were eager to do it. They prayed. They prayed that very night, and they prayed hard. When the brothers wrote letters to each other, they found out that the same night that those friends in Columbia, South America, prayed for the sad missionary in Northwestern territories of Canada, the very same night was the night he was thinking about quitting. And then he woke up the next morning and he was willing to keep trying to tell people about Jesus. The prayers of the people way down here in Columbia worked in the life of a missionary way up there in Canada. It was amazing. God listens to the prayers of his people. He listens to your prayers. And when you pray for a missionary who may be far, far away, God can answer those prayers and do that missionary some good. So I want you to realize you can pray for missionaries. And right now, we're trying to get people to say, I'll pray for a missionary on a regular basis. You can do that too. And I hope you'll ask your mom and dad to help you because they'll know how to help you pray regularly for a missionary in 2024. Okay? Ask mom and dad. They'll help you. 
If they don't, come see me. I'll talk to them. <laughs> now, to help you remember that you can and should pray for missionaries, I've got a fun sheet for you here that you can color, that you can write your missionary's name on, that you can uh, list some things that you want to pray for them. And this will help you remember to pray regularly for your missionary. So wherever they are, you can be doing them good with your prayers right here in Huntersville or Denver or Cornelius or Iron Station or wherever you live. Here you go. One for everybody. There you go, Levi. Kara. Zoe. Here you go, big guy. All right, now, let's pray. Father, thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for doing good in the lives of those for whom we pray. Help us to learn how to pray regularly for missionaries around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks very much. Okay, get run over squatting down right there. <laughs>
and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said, and then he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had happened to Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. This is the word of God, which is flawless, like silver, refined in a furnace of clay, and purified seven times. There come into our lives some, sometimes those specific moments, those moments of great import, those hinge moments, the, the beginning of a, a new era, a new phase of life. We observed one uh, just this week, the 531st anniversary of Columbus's voyage to America, October the 12th, 1492. And coming up, October the 31st, will be the 506th anniversary of that event that sparked the Protestant Reformation, that day in 1517 when this monk, Martin Luther, nailed his 45 points of debate on the castle door there at at Wittenberg, Germany. But I'd suggest to you that this episode we've read about in Acts chapter 12 today describes another pivotal moment, a very crucial moment in history, one of the most crucial moments in the history of Christian missions, uh, to be sure. And that moment came when Peter was put into prison. 13 or 14 years earlier, the Jews and the Roman authorities had thought they had put to bed once and for all this troublesome thing of the Christian life, of the, the way They had executed its leader, one Jesus of Nazareth. But the thing that had become known as Christianity had not gone away at all. It had grown. In the face of the most intense persecution imaginable, it could not be wiped out. And so torturing and murdering Christians, like dousing a pan of blazing grease with a pot of cold water, just spread the fire. It is true what the second century orator Church father Tertullian said, we of Christians, we multiply when you reap us. The blood of Christians is seed. And so now Christianity has moved out from Jerusalem, its birthplace. It's moving out in ever widening circles to all of Judea and then out to Samaria, Samaria, beginning its rather relentless march, which eventually would spread the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. This historical moment was critical because Christianity was on the verge of leaving its status as a little regional religion and moving out to become a worldwide phenomenon. For the enemies of Christ back in Jerusalem, this thing was really getting under their skin. And so while the believers scattered under this persecution, the apostles, those remaining of the original 12 disciples, had stayed in the city under the instruction of the Holy Spirit. And the king there in Judea, King Herod, had already put to death the apostle James. He was the brother of John, the two sons of Zebedee, you know, the two who were vying for positions at Jesus' right and left hand. He had put him to death by the sword, and when he saw how that pleased the Jews, he thought he would raise the ante raised the stakes. And so now he goes after the apostle who in this intervening time had become the spokesman for all the group, the de facto leader of the whole troublesome group of Christians, this one man, Peter. So first Herod has him arrested. He'd planned to have him stand trial as soon as the Passover feast was finished. Peter didn't stand a chance. There was no way he was going to survive because this so-called trial was going to be just a formality. If Herod's justice had put James to the sword, James, who apparently kept a much lower profile, who kept more in the background, who didn't have all that much to say, whom we hear so much less about, if he had fallen victim to the sword and its execution, well, Peter's execution was just a foregone conclusion because Peter was the spokesman. He was bold. He was brash. He was an out front kind of a guy. Well, let's state it plainly. Peter had a big mouth. And Herod now had him in prison. And look at the security they put on this fellow. Verse 4, after arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each, four shifts of guards, first, second, and third shift, and then a shift for the weekend, perhaps, or more likely, one shift for each of the four watches of each day, rotating every six hours. 
And then look how they stationed themselves. Verse 6, he was bound with two chains, two soldiers right with him, even while he slept, and at least two more soldiers outside the door. Maximum security. Impenetrable. Talk about an impossible situation. But God specializes in impossible situations. So an angel struck Peter on the side. I wonder how hard an angel hits anyway. And his chains fell off. And he passes the guards. I don't know how. Were they put to sleep? Was Peter made invisible? He passed right by them. And the iron gate opened for them all by itself. This was not like the automatic doors they have at Harris Teeter in Publix. This was a divine intervention. And so they go the length of one street together. And then as suddenly as he appeared, the angel vanishes from sight. Peter is by himself. He seems to have been in something of a daze up to this point, not really sure what was going on. He saw it, but he thought maybe it was just a vision or just a dream. But now he was sure that it was real. He really was out of prison. And scripture says, when this dawned on him, he went to the house of John Mark's mother. And I've always seen this as a rather comical scene. He knocks on the door, Rhoda comes to the door, the servant girl, she's so overjoyed to hear Peter's voice that she turns around and doesn't open the door. She leaves him standing outside on the street, exposed there. His friends, of course, are skeptical, must be his angel. His angel apparently reflecting a belief on their part that a person had a guardian angel with the suggestion that the angel sometimes showed himself and took on the appearance of the person that he served. Must be his angel. But Peter keeps on knocking. In the end, it is the guards who are executed, not Peter. What a marvelous story. And not just a story, but the living Word of God. Now, I left out a couple of things, a couple of parts. While this enormous drama had been unfolding behind the scenes, There was another drama, just as dramatic, unfolding there, but very powerfully. From the time that Peter had been locked up in prison with his special detail of four personal guards every shift, what had the church been doing? Verse 5, so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. I love the way that is put. They were earnestly praying for him earnestly. There are a couple of things here I want you to see. Their prayers were earnest, heartfelt, sincere, with a sense of urgency. They knew Herod's reputation. They knew his cruelty. And they knew Peter's vulnerability, his certain destiny, as long as Herod had him in his hands. They prayed earnestly. How often do you pray earnestly? When do your prayers leave the routine, leave the ho-hum, leave the obligatory, and move into the realm of earnest praying? I think there are a couple of things here that go into making our prayers earnest. First of all, when we recognize the great need, when there is a crisis, and you see it, and you sense the urgency of that situation, and Peter's situation certainly fit into that category. And secondly, what causes you to pray earnestly is when we personally identify with that situation. These churchmen in in Jerusalem, these church people there, they, they knew Peter. They lived with him. They'd sat under his teaching. They knew his witness and his testimony and his character. He was their friend. He was their leader. Their lives were intertwined with him, his. It was a very personal thing to them. His problems were their problems. When Peter was wounded, these people bled. Now, we talk a lot. We talk a lot about praying for missionaries, talk a lot about praying for the even evangelization of the world, but how often does that result in earnest prayer? Earnest praying. The problem with our praying lies right here that we fail to sense the urgency and we don't personally identify with the situation. I mean, personally. 
The evangelization of the world is the number one priority for the church. After we worship, the evangelization of the world is the number one priority for Southlake Church. It is that which we should engage in with earnestness. This is the one thing that Jesus singled out as the mission of his followers when he ascended back into heaven after his resurrection. That they go and make disciples of all nations. That they go and change the world. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And here's what I do with that authority. I command you to go and to make disciples of all nations. With that total authority, this is my marching orders for you. And yet, chances are that when we pray, we can't even pray for that goal earnestly. Pray earnestly for missions. And praying is the least that we can do. It's the easiest thing that we can do. It's because we are too often blinded to the urgency, and we don't personally identify with the situation. It is a problem, therefore, of education and of personal commitment. One of the main reasons that we organize a missions emphasis each year is to address that problem. To help ourselves become educated as to the urgency of the need. And to do that, we bring in the finest missionary spokesmen that we can find. We bring in as many of them as it is possible for us to accommodate. We put the missionaries front and center, and we try to zero our attention on what they tell us about Christ's number one priority and what God is doing to accomplish that priority where they come from, out there in the world, the world that they see, that they witness. We give them as many chances as we can to report on the progress of the work, on their hopes for the future. We ask them to apprise us, to educate us as to their current needs. We put them in your homes. We invite them to our cookouts. We make as many opportunities as we can for you to rub shoulders with them, gaining exposure to their insight, their expertise. The hope being that we would become better educated to the need, that we would feel the urgency of the task, that we would catch some of the fire, some of their zeal for the work. And we run our conference, our emphasis, for a whole month. Why so long? Why not just do it on one Sunday and get it over with? Because we need to get personally acquainted with these people so they can emphasize the importance of our partnership with them. If we're ever going to pray earnestly for them, we have to know who they are. We have to know the goals they have, the challenges they face, the progress they make, and also the defeats that they suffer. Just like the, the Jerusalem church knew and loved Peter and had watched his ministry grow and flourish, they then were able earnestly to pray for him. And in this annual emphasis, we also give you as many opportunities as we can to become personally involved, to become personally committed to this urgent priority of world missions. You're given opportunities to commit yourself to pray regularly for a particular missionary or mission work during the course of the coming year. And you're also given opportunities to commit yourself personally, sacrificially, to financial support through our faith promise giving ministry that their financial needs will be met. You know, when your wallet is involved, you will become personally committed. That's where the rubber really meets the road. You're given opportunities to commit yourself to serving as a missionary yourself, either on short-term projects like those that disaster response would be offering to us or other ways, or Lord willing, even as a career as a world missionary. We we're praying that the Lord would move in the lives of individuals or families. And before long, we would see missionaries come out of South Lake Church and begin to serve in other places. But there's another thing suggested in this language of verse 5. Notice that it does not say the church prayed to God for Peter, but that the church was earnestly praying for him. Do you get the ongoing feel of that, the continuity of that, the persistence of that, this ongoing commitment to prayer. They didn't just pray for him once and let it go. They kept on praying. That's why when Peter was released from prison and went to the house of his friends from the church, of course, he found them in a prayer meeting. It had been that way all along from the beginning of his imprisonment 
right up to the eve of his trial. They were hard at their prayer ministry. And those references to prayer in that long uh, narrative that I read to you from chapter 12 might be missed. You could read right over them. But I'll tell you, I believe that is the key. Those points, the prayer that began when he was in prison, the prayer that was continuing when he was miraculously released, that's the key. That's the hinge. Because when Peter went to prison, the church was praying. When he was freed from prison, the church was praying. These references serve as bookends to this whole astounding thing. Now, what would have happened if they had not prayed? It was the power of prayer that accounts for his release. Now, I know, I know there was a powerful, a mighty angel who came. Pastor Dan, what about the angel? Yes, the angel was there. He was the agent through which this, this miraculous release was brought about. But the power of prayer brought the angel to Peter. God works the prayers of his people into his own divine operations so that those prayers become the means by which his sovereign, unchangeable purposes are carried out. And look how powerful these prayers were. The people in that prayer meeting, those who had been praying for Peter all along, they were as surprised as anybody that the, the thing worked. They were as surprised as anybody that he was free. He came to their door. And when Rhoda told them, no, no, that's not Peter. You must be out of your mind. What do I conclude? People who pray often do not recognize the power that their prayers carry. You think it's a little thing. God sees it as a mighty thing. Their prayers were effectual, and they themselves were the most surprised. Don't be in that category. Have great faith in God. He is a great God. He's capable of everything according to His perfect will. Pray big prayers, because we pray to a big God. Can you believe that your regular, fervent prayers for a missionary might do something on the scale of what we see operating in Peter's experience? They can. They can. But only if you pray. So how did it all come out? Well, Peter hushed them, told them the story. He slipped away, hiding for a little while. His guards were executed. And you know, I didn't read about it, but not long after, Herod died himself. The rest of Acts 12 tells that amazing story. Herod, refusing to deny the cries of the people that he was not a man at all, that he was God, an angel of the Lord. Was it the same angel who freed Peter? I don't know. But an angel of the Lord struck him down, the Bible says, and he was eaten by worms and died. The king is dead. The prisoner is free. Peter continues to minister. And his influence is crucial. I told you that at this point in the history of the early church, world evangelization was about to explode. This was a crucial point in history. And Peter was right at the center of it. About five years after this, there came the great council of Jerusalem. The question that brought that council into being was how freely the gospel of Christ could be offered to non-Jews. It had been such a strongly Jewish thing up to this point. Now we were moving out to the Gentile world. How freely could this offer of, of salvation be offered to those who had not been through the Jewish traditions? Were they going to attach strings to this thing? Was there going to be a barrier to the free offer of the gospel by putting all of this extra requirement of circumcision and all these rituals on the Gentiles who'd never known anything about them? If the Jewish Christians attached too many strings to the gospel, it was going to cripple the progress of the spread of that gospel throughout the world. It would never get beyond the Jewish world. And so the apostles gathered there in Jerusalem Paul and Barnabas, among them by that time, they had a conference. You can read all about it in Acts chapter 15. And when the time of decision came, some said this, some said that. But when the time for making a decision came, one speaker carried the day. One speaker so highly respected, one speaker so persuasive carried the day. It was Peter. He said, brothers, 
Why should we try to put a burden on the Gentile disciples even we Jews have not been able to bear? No. Adherence to Jewish ritual, that is not the thing. We believe that it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we're saved and through that alone. And Peter's argument won the day at the Jerusalem Council. The gospel was to be freely shared, not only among the Jews, but throughout the provinces of Greece, even as far as Rome. And so with this last barrier down, the gospel could then proceed to do what it's been, what has happened to it, that it would be preached to the uttermost parts of the earth. This moment was a hinge on which the entire endeavor of world evangelization swung. What if Peter had not been there? What if he had never been released from that prison? What if those earnestly praying members of the church in Jerusalem, without even realizing the implications of what they were doing, had not been shielding missions through prayer? Brothers and sisters, we're called upon to carry on that powerful ministry of prayer for the kingdom of God. And we're giving you a chance in this emphasis month to sign in, sign up, to commit yourself to that involvement. You have a a flyer in your uh, bulletin, the yellow sheet. This is your commitment sheet. Uh, You can check off in the little box on the side by the name of any missionary or missionaries for whom you wish to pray. And if you can't find one, you know there, you can check the box that says, assign me a missionary who needs a prayer partner. Or you may have a missionary outside this list, like a Steve Jessen, for example. You want to pray for him? That's okay. It doesn't really matter what missionary you're praying for. You decide and then make that commitment to pray regularly. In 2024, get your families involved. Parents, get your children involved. We want every prayer to be registered and every prayer to count. And so you can fill out this form, or you can go to our website, slchurch.net. There's a button on the home page. Click there, and you can do this electronically. You can do it online, either way. And our prayer is that 100 people would commit to pray regularly for a missionary or missionary agency in 2024. If you'll sign up to pray, we'll help you. We'll make sure you get regular prayer updates from the field, from the missionary you choose. We've got a wonderfully efficient missionary post office working here at South Lake Church. And when those prayer letters come in, we make sure they get into your hands so you can pray knowledgeably and in a current uh, fashion for what really is on that missionary's heart and on his plate, uh, the the needs that they're facing. So there's a, a basket in the back to receive these as you go out today. Or go online and make your commitment there. This is not the last opportunity. We'll be giving you opportunities throughout the month. But please, take this to heart. And do this powerful and yet simple thing. To pray for the kingdom to come. Let's pray now. Father, we thank you for your attentiveness. You're the one who never slumbers nor sleeps. You're the one who, as it were, is always on duty to receive the prayers of your people, especially as they're mediated by the Holy Spirit and channeled through the wounds of Christ. And so we pray that you would move us to become those who pray in an earnest fashion, recognizing the urgency and also having personal identification with the need. Grant it for the sake of Christ, in whose name we do pray. Amen. Please stand. Come thou fount of every blessing to
Steve, it's a great delight to have you. He's going to be in the uh, pavilion eating hamburgers and hot dogs and drinking soda pop. You look him up and spend some time talking to him and seeing into his heart. Let some of that earnestness uh, rub off on you. I'll have the benediction and immediately following a table blessing for the food so we can proceed uh, right away to the business at hand. Now receive God's blessing. May the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by His grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and equip you for every good deed and word.